Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science. My name is Minou Shafiq, and I am the President and Vice Chancellor here at LSE. And this evening, we are going to discuss a new book published by Dr. Erica Thompson, which is called Escape from Model Land, which explores the role of mathematical models in society. And it is an incredibly important and timely book that is very consistent with LSE's own role as, the world, as a world leading research institution interested in political, economic, and social problems. Given we at LSE have ourselves uh, created many models, uh, we are well positioned and in need of rethinking their role given the revolution in data sciences and the application of AI in so many aspects of our lives. Of course, data sciences is revolutionizing the social science, sciences just as it has the natural sciences and the life sciences. The availability of big data coupled with massive increases in computing power has radically transformed our world. In my own field in economics, things like using mobility data to assess what's happening in the economy, new ways to estimate economic activity, uh, being able to understand what's happening in the economy in real time, as opposed to relying on quarterly statistics from national statistics authorities has revolutionized the field. LSE is very much embracing this change in, in order to keep social sciences at the forefront of global thinking and impact. And during the pandemic, we heard a lot of policymakers, decision makers, and others urging us to follow the science. And yet we know what is, what is considered the science is highly contested from the collection of data and the models that are used to the assumptions that underpin them we know that there are many questions to ask. And tonight we have an, a panel that will enable us to answer those, to ask those questions and lift the lid on the use of science for decision support. And hopefully that will mean we can be savvier both about the science and, and also the decisions that we make using it. So uh, just a few practicalities before we start. For those who are Twitter, Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE model land. This event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast afterwards. As usual, at the end of this event, we, we will uh, ask, give you an opportunity to ask questions in the audience, as well as those who are online. If those who are online could use the Q&A function to submit your questions and let us know your name and affiliation. We would be particularly keen to hear from students and alumni. Uh, and for those of you in the theater, you can raise your hand in the old analog traditional way. Um, let me now turn to introduce our speakers. I, before the session, we were trying to figure out what the opposite of a manal is. Many of you have probably heard that term of all male panel, academic panels. Well, this is the opposite. It could be a womanal or a femnal or uh, someone I hope will invent something better, but I am delighted. I think it's the first one I've chaired. We're gonna start with Dr. Erica Thompson, who's a senior policy fellow in the ethics of modeling and simulation at LSE's Data Sciences Institute, which is funded by, and she is funded by the UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship. We'll then hear from Professor Diana Coyle, who's the Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge. She, Diana co-directs the Bennett Institute where she heads research under the themes of progress and productivity. And her latest book is called Cogs and Monsters, what economics is and what it should be. And it covers how economics needs to change to keep pace with the 21st century and the digital economy. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Stephanie Hare, who's a researcher, broadcaster, and author focused on technology, politics, and history. She was selected for the BBC's Expert Women Program and the Foreign Policy Interrupted Fellowship. The whole effort is under the auspices of LSE's Data Sciences Institute, which was launched recently to spearhead the work on data sciences and the social sciences here at the school. And we encourage you all to engage with it. 
So with that, let me now turn to Erica to present the findings of her book. We're just sharing the screen for the Zoom audience here. Um, so thank you so much, Manoush, for the kind introduction. And it's really great to be here, especially with a, a high-powered woman all. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to just run through. I mean, there are, there are a huge number of different themes in my book, and I'm just going to run through a few of them. And I hope that when we get to the discussion, that we'll hear from a lot of you in the audience as well about the kinds of ways that you've used models or perhaps been affected by models or influenced by the way that models are being used by other people that determine things that happen in, in your life, as so many of us have over the last few years, and we can expect that to continue. So I think this is a really timely topic. Certainly it was when I started writing this book three years ago, and, it, and that was pre-pandemic, and suddenly it's even more topical and interesting now, as we've, as we've seen over the past couple of years with all of the decisions that have been made. Um, so I wanted to start by, by sort of introducing uh, a distinction, because I think there are, there are many different kinds of models that we use. And um, one, of the, one of those kinds of models are the kinds of models that tell us what will happen when we throw a ball up in the air, the kinds of models that have put um, astronauts on the moon that have put spacecraft on Mars. And these models are incredibly good and incredibly powerful and they underlie the modern world and they are extremely successful in doing what they do. They are very reliable and they help us to make better decisions. But those forecasts, those kind of models, I'm that I make the distinction that they are essentially interpolatory in nature. They take past data and they project forward perhaps, but they are making, making those projections based on an expectation that the underlying conditions are not changing. So we expect that the past data that we have are 100% relevant for the forecast that we're making for tomorrow. And we see that that is the case in, in all of these different situations. But then I want to contrast that with a different kind of model. Um, and these are models where we are projecting forward into a future which is different from today, a future where the underlying conditions might be changing, where the past data that we have are not necessarily totally relevant for the future. And we might think in that context of models like climate models, where we have a lot of past data of what the climate was like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, but that we know, the one thing we do know about the climate of the future is that it will be quite different. The underlying conditions, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are changing. And we might think also of economic and social systems where the, um, the underlying conditions again are changing because the politics are changing, societies are changing. The way, that, the way that the system itself works is changing, even though there might be some underlying regularities. And in the case of climate, of course, the laws of physics, we hope, will be the same. Um, but we have to then make, make our assessment of confidence in those models based on a more holistic understanding of model quality. So we have to be making expert judgments about the degree to which the model is accurately representing the world. <laughs> We do have some data, we don't have no data. We're not just diving in and saying these models are wonderful or these models are terrible. We are, we're coming to that judgment based on a good understanding and good information. Um, but we are going to have, you know, we, we cannot just uh, quantify and, and understand based on what we have previously observed. And so, I'm kind of presenting you with this spectrum of models from the, the ones that, uh, that take our spacecraft to Mars in a spectrum. And then there are some which are sort of based on models, based on previous data and on expert judgment. And we go out to the very speculative models, perhaps of the far future, which are much more based on expert judgment than on data. So thinking about this spectrum as well, that will kind of underlie the, the remarks that I'm going to make. And thinking about the kinds of decision questions that we might be interested in, in public policy, decision making, in business perhaps, um, those, many of those forward looking decision questions fall towards the extrapolatory end of the, end of the spectrum. So I've put a few examples down here, you might be able to think of other examples from your own work or your own 
sort of your life and your understanding of how uh, government are making decisions perhaps on your behalf. So I'm really interested in this extrapolatory end. And I'll talk about a few examples that where the, where the issues with these models are so clear, and perhaps then we can sort of use those to think also about the middle of the spectrum where maybe it's less obvious what the problems are. So just to introduce my book and the idea of model land. So model land is where you are when you're sort of inside your model, when your assumptions are true, when everything works. You, you know, you have the model, uh, you've written down your equations or you've put it into the computer, you've made your spreadsheet, whatever it is that you're doing. And inside that box is where you are when you're in model land. Everything works. You can do the statistics. You can, you can, you can make everything come out nicely. You can draw a pretty picture of what the future would be like within the model if we do this and if we do that. But my, my book is called Escape from Model Land because, of course, nobody... Nobody lives in model land. The only reason for making a model and for doing this simplification uh, and putting all this stuff onto a computer is so that we can inform decision-making in the real world. And so I'm particularly interested in how we take that step of, of getting the information that we have in our models out of model land into the real world to be able to say what we expect to happen to us, to you, to me, to the society that we live in if we do X and if we do Y, not just what will happen to this little pixel in our computer or this agent that we've programmed. We want to know what happens in the real world. So I'm gonna just dive in and give you an example. And this might look slightly scary, but essentially it's just a pre presentation of six different models. And these are models of, you don't need to look at the details. There's just lots of different colors. <coughs> you, these, the models, these are models of what the energy mix in 2100 will be like for a set of integrated assessment models, which are models of the energy system and the climate system. And so these models, uh, take in assumptions about prices. They take in where the energy system is now and say, how do we expect the cost of solar power to decrease in the future? Or what do we think the cost of nuclear decommissioning will be? And puts all that together and projects forward based on least cost pathways to 2100 um, to say, how can, we, how can we meet our climate targets? And so obviously we have a, a baseline of what would happen in the absence of any action to change things. And then we have a scenario uh, where we meet the Paris Agreement target of two degrees, say, or you could put in 1.5 if you want to do that. Um, and, and so the model says, what, what is the cheapest way of meeting that target? What is the, the mix of energy that will allow us to uh, meet our targets and keep the lights on, say? Um, and so first thing you can see is that there are six different models and they give you six different answers. So why is that? Why do you expect, obviously you expect that different people are coming to this system and, and they have got perhaps slightly different data, perhaps slightly different assumptions, perhaps they have different ideas about how things will evolve in the future or what the effect of a carbon tax might be or the, uh, the, the effect on pricing of a certain technology if we develop it in a certain way. Um, and so they get, they get these different answers. Uh, now, does that, does that encompass our sort of range of uncertainty? Why are we getting different answers? How should this inform policymaking? So I'm interested in thinking about what the ethical questions are that underlie these models. You know, before we start to get to the maths, what is, the, what is going on here? Who's, whose judgments are being represented in these models? So if we were to, for example, introduce a, a new technology where we can pay people a certain amount of money to reduce their energy consumption, if you put that in at uh, $2 per tonne of carbon dioxide avoided, then it will be hugely used because it will be extremely economically viable relative to energy production technologies. If you put it in at $2,000 per tonne of carbon dioxide avoided, it won't be used at all and it won't turn up in the models. And if you put it in somewhere in between, it'll be somewhere in between. So whose decision is it 
that something like that is politically feasible or isn't politically feasible. If we don't put it in at all, we're effectively putting an infinite price on the cost of behavior change. And that's quite a big value judgment. There are other value judgments in there as well. I mean, if we, if we consider the, the other things that could be there, the what are the net costs of uh, fossil fuels, for example, and there are many different ways of calculating those different costs and then integrating this into a model like this. So you can see that actually, if I'd taken a, a different starting point, I could end up with very different answers. And the statistical consequences then for people doing you know, more advanced data science or working with these models and trying to understand how we can put them together uh, is that the, when we take these six different model runs, you might sort of naively say, well, how about we take the difference between these different model runs to be an indication of the uncertainty in the possible outcomes. But they're not six independent darts thrown at a dartboard. They are the, effectively the opinions of six different people or perhaps groups of people working on this problem and their value judgments may not necessarily be independent. In fact, their value judgments are probably very similar because it's the same kind of people who are working on this. They are people probably with um, you know, science and engineering degrees from elite universities. They're well-educated, they're middle-class, they, all of these sorts of things. You know, they, they are a very homogeneous group of people working on these. And so one of my arguments in the book is that in order to understand models more holistically and in order to get better statistical understanding of the range of uncertainty in modeled systems, we need to be working towards a diversity of models and that implies that we need a diversity of modelers. Here's another example. Now you're probably all familiar with this because these are the models, this is um, a model produced in March 2020 by Imperial College uh, which was essentially what motivated the lockdowns uh, in that month um, because of COVID. So the pandemic, the predictions of how the pandemic would evolve based on the you know, relatively little information that we had at that time. And so you can see, you know, nobody would have expected, of course, that the, that the pandemic would evolve in this way exactly. You know, you don't expect it to just go up and down neatly. You expect there to be much more complicated stuff going on, but this was a sort of a sketch, a caricature of how things might evolve depending on what kinds of actions you take. And so you have, again, the same sorts of ethical questions arise because we, we should ask, how was it decided? What were the policy options that would be represented here? Who decided that we were going to talk about whatever it says, case isolation, household quarantine, and general social distancing, and school and university closure? You know, those were the policy options on the table, but there might have been other possibilities. There might be somebody, you know, the, the way that the, the model incorporates those and not other options means that your political discussion is about the options that are in the model and not about other options. And the same could be said, going back to those integrated assessment models of the lack of behavior change in those models and perhaps more controversially, even the lack of geoengineering in those models. If someone were to introduce into an integrated assessment model, um, solar radiation management, geoengineering, you know, this idea of putting up sulfates into the atmosphere to uh, effectively shade out the sun a bit and therefore cool the planet slightly. If those kinds of techniques were introduced into the models, they would suddenly become a policy option in a way that they haven't been. And that, you know, that's a hugely powerful thing for models to have and, and for modelers to be taking on the option to sort of decide what are what, what's on the table for policymakers. So I think we have to just be really, really careful how we look at these models, how we think about them, how we interrogate them. Now, I wanted to just go through a quick, this is the sort of mathematical interlude, if you like, but uh, hope somebody re reviewed my book on Amazon and said it doesn't contain any maths. And this is the mathematical bit. So hopefully nobody will recognize this as maths. Um, but if we suppose we have a set of models, 
here we are. Here's our models. Everybody likes cat pictures. I might, maybe not uh, Diane's dog. Um, but so the the cats, the cats. If these are sort of metaphorically our set of models, seven different models, they have a lot in common with each other. How are we going to use these seven different models to understand what reality looks like? Now, I suspect you can you can see where I'm going here. But the first thing we might do is take a um, take a measurement. We'll go out and we'll say, do any of these correspond to reality? Well, we need to know what reality looks like. So we go out into the world, the real world, and we'll take a measurement. Here's our measurement down at the bottom there. We've just taken a little bit and it's a uh, looks a bit like a tail and it's fluffy and it's sort of yellowish. So we go back to the cats, which one is it most like? Are we going to do a sort of, depending on what your model calibration technique is, you know, your fancy maths, this will be dressed up in lots of fancy maths. Are you going to take the one with long fur? Are you going to take the one that is somewhat yellow? Are you going to take an average of all of them? Are you going to weight the ones that look most like it the most? Are you going to throw out some that are not consistent with the observation that we've taken? Or are you going to somehow try to retain information from all of them? Well, right, you've probably guessed where I'm going. So here's reality. <laughs> and, and the point is that the cats, they were very informative about the dog. You know, they have a lot of structure in common with it, but taking an average of those cats isn't actually going to tell you what the dog looks like. And it, it is, even if you make it fuzzy, the, the dog is certainly distinguishable from an out of focus cat. So the statistical methods that we use to analyze that group of models, given that they have more in common with each other than with reality, we have to be extremely careful about exactly how we do that. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about the maths, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but this is sort of indicative of the problems that we face. So just one final point here. Um, and again, going back to the cats. So if we've got a set of seven cats, you know, and we say all our models have something in common, um, how informative is that about reality? Well, it might be or it might not, and it depends what the purpose is that you want to put it to. So if you want to know whether your dog is going to um, chase a stick, then the cats are not informative. But if you want to know uh, sort of what its internal organs look like, then it's probably quite informative. If you want to know what, if you want to decide what to give it to eat, that's probably pretty informative. <clears throat> Models are good at some things and not good at others, but you have to define the purpose before you evaluate it. So, this, this point, I think, is a, a critical one for my book, and we, I talk about it quite a lot, but the, we have to move from just generating more models. If we added more cats onto that group of cats, it wouldn't tell us any more about the dog. And continually adding more cats is just a waste of effort because it isn't giving us more relevant information. So we don't need to know that all models show eggs. You know, we don't need more copies of the morning newspaper to tell us that what it says is true. That doesn't actually help. What we would like to know is that there is no plausible model that shows not X, that shows something else happening. And that is a reframing of the same question. And yet now you can immediately see, I think, that the word plausible is doing a huge amount of work here. So how are we then going to decide what we mean by a plausible model? How are we going to decide, you know, what counts, what is allowed to get into the system? What is, who is allowed to make a model that we will call plausible? Does it have to be written in a mathematical language? Does it have to be run on the best, you know, fanciest computer available? Does it have to speak the right kind of technical language? Does it have to be published in the right journals? Does it have to come from someone who is at the right institution? And so we have all sorts of questions about now about gatekeeping in science and about how we understand expertise and how we trust science or whether we trust science or to what degree and in what respects we trust science. That actually this is first order to the mathematics. This is really important to the mathematics, the question of trust in science. It is not 
an add-on that we come to afterwards. It's something that is actually part of the inference procedure of how we understand what we can say based on a set of mathematical models. So I just want to leave you with that thought and that idea that in order to make confident inferences from models, we need to trust them and we need to be pushing the boundaries. We need to be pushing, we, we don't need to be trying to make them all say the same thing. We need to be working as hard as we can to make them say different things. And then if they don't, that's informative. And so in order to do that, we need diversity of models. We need to be, we need to be making models from as many different perspectives as we can. And in order to do that, we need a very great range of different people with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different understandings and different ways of thinking about the world, making their different models and having them considered at the same table and at the same level as the other ones. Okay, so I think I will stop there. Here are a few, um, a few kind of key points. Maybe the very last one is, the, is to end on is, is to say, that we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Once we have escaped from model land and we've done all that, and we've understood wh what our models really are and that they have this social and political content, and we've made efforts to, to in incorporate this diversity, that's great. We need to beware, I think, of the, the possibility of a slippery slope of relativism. You know, you, you don't want to say, ah, well, having said all that, you know, you have your experts and I have mine and I don't trust your models and let's throw it all out. Because, you know, remember that spectrum. Remember that we have a core. We have genuinely good reason to believe that these models contain information, that they can do great things for us, that they can support decisions that are better than they would have been otherwise. So we need to be working to preserve that information content and you know, defining the limits of modeling without undermining the science. So that might be a good place to hand on to whoever's next. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm delighted to be here today for several reasons, particularly to congratulate Dr. Thompson on her superb book. Um, and I'm delighted that Professor Coyle can be with us as well because Professor Coyle helped edit this book, Technology is Not Neutral, a short guide to technology ethics, which I'm going to present briefly here. So this is a, a real sort of, sometimes feel like scholarship is a, a race where you're passing batons to each scholar in the interdisciplinary, it's like a bad joke. What happens when a mathematician, a historian, and an economist walk into a bar? <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna find out um, in this presentation. So um, the structure of this very fast presentation will be as follows. We're gonna look at what is technology ethics? Um, there's a debate. So I would invite you to have a view before the presentation and after. So I'll give you the signal as to when you can start to change your mind, because um, it's always fun to see if you can change your mind. And then the fun part, because I feel at the London School of Economics, rerum cognoscere causas, we don't just want to describe the causes, we don't just want to know about the problem, we want to start solving it. So how do we go from diagnosis of our problems to solutions? So very, very quickly, I just wanted to put this up there. The flags show the accent situation, American via France now in the UK. Um, and I'm really pleased to be back here at the LSE because I studied at the International History Department for a master's and PhD, private sector experience and some broadcasting. So I sometimes do radio uh, for the BBC. So if you're up one to two in the morning with insomnia, listening to the World Service, you might hear me talking about business from time to time. And that's where a lot of the examples for this presentation will come from. So very quickly, while working on this book, often during the pandemic, often locked into my flat alone going quietly mad, which I'm sure we can all relate to, I wanted to have a problem statement and I wanted it on a three by five note card pinned on the wall. So that it would just be really simple because you can get quite 
lost on a four-year project. So you want to stay focused. And Tom Cruise being my guru in, in this as in all things, um, what is the mission impossible for this book? It was just a simple problem statement. How can we create and use technologies so that they maximize the value and minimize the harm for society? Because you're working with stuff that's going to be potentially built out at scale for millions of people, but everybody's different. So how do you square that circle? And how do you square that circle when something that's working really well for some people could literally threaten the lives of others? So I wanted to come up with a tool. Um, this is by no means a perfect tool and you get used to uh, when building technology as opposed to just talking about it, you have to um, go through a little bit of a period of bereavement with seven stages where you go in with the perfect sketch and the perfect models and the perfect data assumptions and designs, and then you face plant into reality. And very quickly you start getting pretty messy and haggard and saying, we just need a minimum viable product or a minimum viable tool set. It is not perfect, but we still have to build something. The client needs something. Or if you're working for the government and you're working on counterterrorism or delivering a pandemic response, you can't wait for perfect. Perfect might never come. So for those of us who like to think of our tools in a really physical object, I offer you a longstanding tool that many people around the world have, a Swiss army knife with the six main branches of philosophy. Now, if there are any philosophers here in the room, I apologize. You'll be like, but where is ontology? And <laughs> where are all the many other very complicated things? And I'm like, you just, we can't scare the non-philosophers. <laughs> just something simple. Um, and just as uh, Dr. Thompson was talking about these questions of reality, we have the branch of metaphysics, which is what is reality? We have epistemology, which is who is our source of knowledge, who or what are our reliable sources of knowledge? And we're living in a, a time when both of those questions are being interrogated more than ever. And you will find routinely uh, people who can't agree on what's happening or what's a trusted source of truth, right? Or fact, everybody's got their own facts, their own opinions. Um, how are we gonna, how are we going to work through who's doing what? That's where we come to logic. How do we know what we know? So just as valid for people working in computer science um, and mathematics and the hard sciences as it is for those of us going into law or my field of history. How are you working through it? Political philosophy is kind of the branch about power. So how does, how does power fall within society or even within the planet? If you wanted to open it up to non-human species, you could also talk about power in terms of animal rights or plants or ecosystems. Um, but you could also talk about it in terms of like who in this room right now has power. I've got the mic and the clicker, but the sound people back there could cut me off in a second. Um, but we think about that a lot in terms of who has votes, who has rights, human rights, civil liberties, privacy, um, data rights increasingly, who builds technology, who's in the room building technology, but also who is funding technology, right? all of those things, who regulates it or doesn't regulate it. So political philosophy interpreted here as just power. Aesthetics, I know probably seems like a weird one because we always think about aesthetics now with the 19th century definition of beauty. And that's certainly valid and it's really useful actually in technology ethics, but you could also broaden it out if you wanted to include things like design and specifically user experience, user interface questions accessibility, inclusivity, et cetera. So I kind of, everything that's kind of about the human experience broadly, I would put into design. So why is the Swiss army knife such a successful tool? Loads of people love it. You know, it fits really well in your hand. Um, why are certain tools just flops and certain tools people love? And if you were to take those tools away, they would scream, right? So we all have them. We all have our sort of key preferred tool sets and that tool might not be physical. It might be a software, right? Um, and then ethics, which is where we come to the technology ethics discussion. Ethics is going to be for this chat about values. So that could be good or bad, right or wrong, harm versus benefits, um, however you want to spin it. So this is not ethics as in necessarily good. Um, the United States where I'm from might have its own idea of American values or California where a lot of technology is made is often coming out of a mind space, headspace, ethical formation that is very libertarian. 
um, how technology is done and thought of in terms of the ethical lens in the European Union, very different, and again, in China. And those are just examples we could take it for any country around the world. And that's not to say, by the way, that all Americans have the same ethical view. Uh, we don't agree usually on the best topping for a pizza. So <laughs> you can imagine our debates on politics and technology. But I like the idea of just thinking about it for you personally, and that'll be part of the discussion today for you, is your values and therefore your values when it comes to technology. It's worth thinking about them before you get into a crisis where you have to articulate them, as we'll see in a moment. Now, for those of you who are uh, perhaps more software in nature or even abstract in nature, you can think of philosophy either as the Swiss army knife with your six component tools that we just discussed, or you might wanna think about philosophy as the software of the mind, which is a phrase from the philosopher Julian Bagini. And I really liked that as well, because once you start studying philosophy, and not everybody does in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, we don't often study philosophy. I have a doctorate in philosophy from the LSE and never knowingly took a philosophy class, which is crazy in retrospect, but I spent a lot of time in France where everyone I knew had to study philosophy, I mean, many, many hours of it for high school. They had to take a philosophy examination to pass the baccalaureate to get into university, regardless of what they were going to study, because that's part of the French tradition and indeed many other European countries as well. That just was the one I, I was exposed to. And I thought that was kind of interesting because I obviously had to go and study philosophy as part of writing this book. And it really is a different way of thinking. And of course, there isn't just one philosophy. Again, there are schools of philosophy and very heated debates within philosophy. So when you start studying philosophy, what you are really doing is studying a mindset, a mentality. And then if you take the global philosophy perspective, you're looking at how different you could do it as a historian, different moments in history, how humans were thinking about these concepts. But you could also be like a German philosopher or a continental philosopher versus a Chinese philosopher or someone who's in India, which is a very beautiful philosophical tradition, all have very different ways of thinking about these categories. So even that isn't static, which is either migraine inducing or wonderful, depending on your personal philosophy. I really liked it because I like optionality, but I also like the structure because whenever you get stuck trying to evaluate the technology. Should I, should I fund this? Should I invest in this? Should I use it? Should I buy it? You can go through these questions. And I have done this with all sorts of teams in government and private sector um, in many different countries now. And it's really helpful because some of us tend to very naturally lean towards certain categories and kind of forget about the others. So if you can just go through it as a checklist, like you're kind of your due diligence you're going through, you'll catch, certainly not everything, but you'll catch probably a bit more than you would have if you just approach it with your own point of view. And you can take philosophy and then ethics and break down your ethics even to you know, meta, what does right even mean? Comparative, um, I'm a middle child, so I feel like I do comparative quite naturally. You know, what's my brother getting? What's my sister getting? <laughs> Are we all getting the same size of ice cream here? What do people think is right? And that differs, again, massively throughout the, the problem you might be examining. So it's worth surfacing that and giving it time. Normative, how should people act? Again, a topic of discussion and debate throughout history and indeed now. And then applied for those of us of a more practical nature who actually have to go and build. It's like, okay, well, you know, how do I put ethics into action? We've articulated our value set. Lots of companies have a mission statement and they're very big on their values. Now you have to walk the walk. Well, what does that look like? So a potentially handy framework if you don't um, already have one, but nice if you're stuck. And then I wanted to think about this question of neutrality, which is itself a loaded term. So let's spend a moment with it. Um, and the obligatory uh, French philosopher, we must have one in every philosophical discussion, I hope, Paul Verlio in this case. I really like the way he articulates it, where he's like, if you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck, electricity, electrocution, um, electricity or the plane, the plane crash. And he says, you know, every technology has its, its negativity at the same time as progress. And he's introducing this concept of attention that's quite useful to have in one's head when thinking through, should we, you know, charge up London with facial recognition technology for the Metropolitan Police, a police force which is already in special measures and has quite a lot of problems on both racism and misogyny. Do you want them also having a technology that 
tends to be very inaccurate towards people with darker skin. Even before we get to the question of, do we want it in their hands if it's an accurate technology? You might say, yes, that trade-off is worth it. London is often a terror target. It's got a knife crime epidemic. Policing numbers have been cut since we had to cut numbers back in 2008 with the financial crisis and pretty much ever since. So we need technology more than ever, right? There's factors that we have to weigh up on something that looks like a piece of cake. So we wanna think the progress and the neg negativity with each moment. So the debate, and this is where I would ask you, record your thinking now and see if it changes within five minutes. Um, the debate is, is it neutral or not technology? And we can take technology as like something hard, like a device, or we can think of it as software, if you want to go to more abstract realms, or even a process like industrialization or the assembly line within a car factory. Do you think it's neutral or not? And if you're like, I'm not really sure how you're defining that, I will now introduce you to two teams and you can potentially figure out where you fit on this spectrum, seeing on who you agree with or who you find you know, absolutely offensive in their view, <laughs> prepare to be provoked. Um, so team one, experts who argue that technology is neutral. This is just a random selection, by the way, um, probably problematic for all sorts of reasons, but just people that I thought were interesting. So Gary Kasparov, was tweeting uh, a few years ago about this, but I really liked it, where he's like, tech is agnostic. Ethical AI is like ethical electricity. So this is a really common view. He's just saying like, you know, AI is AI, electricity is electricity. If you wanna get into ethical questions, that's about how the humans use it, right? That's a people question, ethics, but the tech itself is neutral. Werner Vogels is the chief technology officer at Amazon, and he's someone I focus on a lot in my books. I have a whole chapter on facial recognition technology around the world. So I kind of, <laughs> I kind of love where he's like, it's not my call. It's not my call if facial recognition technology is ethical or not. It's society's call. Uh, because that's a really interesting playbook that you see run out of the West Coast of the United States a lot in the past five to 10 years, which is we can't be making these ethical decisions. That's not democratic. It should, it should go to people through either their consumer choices. So it's actually your fault if the cops are using racist tech um, or it's Congress's fault, which is a subject that everybody in the United States could agree on because we all think Congress is dysfunctional. So <laughs> meanwhile, we'll keep selling because nobody's telling us that we can't because it's not our job to decide if it's right or wrong. That's on you, the user or you, the voter which is convenient uh, if you're making money off of what you're selling. So sometimes steel is used to make incubators for babies, but sometimes steel is used to make guns. So steel is neutral, depends on what you wanna do with it, guns versus babies. And again, for any Americans in the audience, you will probably recognize that as a riff on um, guns don't kill people, people kill people, which is true. Guns don't kill people by themselves. But people can kill a lot of people depending on what kind of gun they're using. So a gun is not a neutral object either, even with a musket that was the kind of weapon for which the second amendment was designed to protect is very different from an AK-15 assault rifle where you could take out probably everyone in this room within a minute. So it's just worth thinking about when we think about what we're actually saying when the tool itself is neutral, is it? Or does the tool itself have, have values and potential this is Professor Daniela Roos. She's Director of Computer Science at the AI Lab at MIT, and therefore obviously very interesting to hear on this topic because she's training some of the top technologists in the United States and probably the world, I would say. And she's definitely of the, it's, it's a people thing. Tools are neutral, it's how people use them. You'll see, I've highlighted in red this bit, um, AI, robotics, machine learning, which is a subset of AI, they are just tools by the people for the people. Again, not a neutral statement for anyone. Sorry to make this a very American chat. I'm not realizing this in the first three slides. But the reason that I wanted to highlight that is that that's, of course, a very loaded phrase for the United States because we talk about government by the people for the people. But even when that first happened back in the 18th century, it wasn't by the people. It was only certain people who got to create the government, certain people who could vote, 
some people were still slaves. Women had no rights at all, right? So even that phrase, I was like, why? why? Um, and tools, of course, are not by the people. If you have ever worked in a technology company and gone in and talked to people designing, people building, if you've ever tried to pitch and get venture capital funding, you will see very clearly it is not democratic and it is not representative. There are certain groups who are overrepresentative and some who are very conspicuously missing. And that matters. It matters who funds and it matters who builds and it matters who uses and it matters who legislates and it matters who regulates. So it's true, they are what we choose to do with them, but there's more to it than that. I would argue, you may disagree, and I hope you do, by the way. This is not a you must agree with me presentation. I'm gonna put some stuff out here pretty clearly in the hopes that it gets your, your views coming out. Um, full disclosure, I once worked at Accenture. Paul Doherty, Chief Tech Officer, Information Officer at Accenture, popped this onto LinkedIn a few years ago, and I thought it was really interesting. He's very thoughtful about technology. And he says, again, is it good or bad? It's neutral. It's the way we humans apply it that makes it good or bad. But interesting, ethics is no longer a peripheral issue in business. It must be core to a company's strategy, culture, operations, and technology. So if technology is neutral, why are ethics core? It's just interesting, like, is it, is it a logical assumption? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I, I put it out there for you again to provoke. Now, the opposite team, people who think it isn't neutral and why. So again, checking in with yourself and your initial views. Were you offended? Were you nodding in agreement? And now let's see what happens when I throw these at you. Um, finally, crossing the Atlantic from American examples and over to the Brits, um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, Taking a design thinking approach, um, an engineering approach, which of course makes sense given his background, ethical rules that we choose to put into the system, into society are affecting it. And I love it where he's like, nothing is self-evident. You have to think through everything, right? That it's gonna be a component of our society, good or bad. Now, this is, for some of you who might love this sort of thinking, you're like, this is beautiful. It can actually become migraine inducing though, because you're like, oh my God, I have to think through everything from how I eat to what I'm wearing, you know, who I'm funding, is it my pension and an ethical funding or not. You start realizing that you're making ethical decisions all the time, um, which is really hard to get out of bed <laughs> and do it right if you want to. So it's complex. Where do you even start with the Sir Tim Berners-Lee model? But it's also a really interesting challenge because it's like, okay, cool. How would we design an ethical society of which technology is obviously a massive component? What would that even look like? When he says it's not self-evident, what does that mean? Go back to first principles, how? Caroline Criado Perez, also a graduate of this fine institution, um, wrote a wonderful book called Invisible Women, Explaining Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. So a design thinking approach for, from Sir Tim and now over to Caroline as well. This book, if you haven't read it, um, it is brilliant. I gifted it to almost everybody uh, the year that it came out because you think you know it, uh, even if you are a raw burning feminist and there's still stuff in there that will just blow your mind. But you don't have to be a broad burning feminist to get value out of, out of it. I actually think, in fact, it's more interesting if you're not, because that's a great example of where you think something might be neutral. And then you start to realize from her examples, and she talks about a few, one of them being voice recognition, speech recognition tools that are used in hospitals that do not recognize female physicians' voices. They are trained on data, largely, of men. So when a male doctor was speaking in an A&E situation, the tools would work, but not for the women. Now you might think, whatever, ladies, sort it out. But <laughs> in A&E, you want your doctors, I certainly want my doctors, to have tools that work for them. And the problem which she cited, which makes you throw the book at the wall when you read it, is that the president of the company said that women should learn to lower their voices when speaking with his tool. Mm -hmm. That was his solution. Right, and you just think, come on. Uh, and that's just one example of many, one of which will come up in a later slide, but I just wanted to put that out there to say, if you would like to challenge yourself and have your mind blown, this is the book. 
This is Professor Sheila Jasanoff, uh, based at Harvard, and her book, The Ethics of Invention, is really beautiful. Um, the, the absolute opposite of a sort of hypey, frothy book about tech. It's very thoughtful. And I love it where she says, you know, the same technologies can be found from Kansas to Kabul, that people experience them differently because people are different, right? They have different needs. They have different constraints. We are not all walking around equal in society, not necessarily for anything to do with us, but because of how society is built. And that therefore, if you're designing technology, if you're regulating it, or if you're trying to assess risk, you want to think about that. Who is the default human for whom most tech is designed? She, echoing Caroline Criado Perez, or vice versa in this case, I think Professor Jessenoff's book came out first, talks about the default human almost always being a man, often a white heterosexual man of a certain body type and shape, um, and why it matters. And I loved her point. She kind of really opens it up and says, you know, the difference in impact isn't just on how we individually experience technology because people will try to trip you up in technology ethics chats by going, I've never had a problem with this, to which you have to go great. Like, <laughs> the world is not just about you. <laughs> it might also be affecting other people. And that is a very legitimate and valid concern. Uh, so great that this tech works for you, but it isn't working for half the population, for example. Um, or it might not be working for some people and it's not just a matter of inconvenience, it becomes a life or death situation. And so it's just unacceptable. We have to mitigate the risk. So great that it worked for you, but not a high enough bar. She also talks about how it changes our relationship with one another. And I think social media is probably the obvious example for all of us. of so those of us who are old enough to remember what the world was like before social media versus now might have different views about whether we think it's a good thing or a bad thing, but even if you've grown up as a digital native, you might have views about how this has changed the way we interact with one another, what happens online, and then also how it affects our life offline. And then she even opens it up to this discussion of it changes our relationship with our environment. Now that might even be like at the extractive level of what it takes to get certain minerals out of the ground to put into our phones, right? Um, but it could be just how we're, how we're powering, how we're powering Bitcoin production, how we're powering batteries for electric vehicles, like literally the environment, what we're belching out into the air. And then Professor Safia Noble, who's over in the US, just won a MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, I wanted to put her in just so that we could have a quick chat about algorithms. Her book, Algorithms of Oppression, is just incredible. It's a very short, really powerful book. And she talks about, you know, algorithms are not faceless and nameless bots, right? So we can't just blame the algorithm when things don't work. These are reflecting people. There are people behind data. There are people behind algorithms and models, all of it. So when you get a policy and people say, follow the science or follow the data, interrogate that statement like mad. You want to be able to audit it. So we're now getting these fields that are coming out of algorithmic auditing. Algorithmic transparency. Should you be able to win a public sector contract if you're saying you can't audit the algorithm because it's our intellectual property? Well, too bad. If you're deciding who gets seen by the NHS based on an algorithm, now we have like questions of justice and equity. At play, we need to be able to interrogate it. So how do you have like public algorithms versus private proprietary ones? So a whole new world is opening up. So. We've just had the two teams. Did anybody change their mind? You don't have to tell me if you did or not. Did anyone go in thinking, I thought it was neutral and now I think it isn't or vice versa? Or did you all stay the same? I'll share some nods, okay, still thinking. Really quickly, just to give examples of diagnosis to solution. This is just a reflection from over 20 years, I'm aging myself here, of practice uh, working on this stuff is that, you know, so what? Like we could talk about philosophy until the cows come home. That's kind of the point with philosophy. It's a never ending, beautiful debate. But we're here with an infinite supply of problems to solve. That's either a good thing or a bad thing if you're a natural problem solver. The complication is, yeah, but our means to solve those problems are pretty constrained, right? There's a time, money, people, factor, urgency, the question, how do we decide which problems we're gonna solve versus not? And then we have to prioritize according to your missions, right? So who cares? And then the now what? So you've decided, okay, the problem is important. We have to solve it. It's a pandemic. 
the NHS is broken, whatever. <laughs> How are we gonna do it? This is my uh, slide for you. You do not have to buy my book. It's on page 202 and it's the checklist that I have had and I've been building uh, in notebooks and then eventually into a note on my phone that I always go through whenever I'm working with people to try to solve problems, just to check in meetings and make sure that we can answer against each of these. Because again, you can get lost. Meetings can be full of time wasters. You yourself may be the time waster. <laughs> so you wanna stay focused. So you can define all of these things. And the one that always keeps me up at night is the second from the bottom of, you know, how will we know if we're wrong? You can come up with beautiful data, beautiful models, come up with a policy that absolutely sounds great. And then you're like, but how will we know if it's the wrong one? How do we know if we're right is one question. How do we know if we're wrong is different. So I offer this to you in the spirit of, of collaborate collegiate sharing. Um, crash test dummies is a great example of, are we solving the right problem or not? There's a lot of problems out there. Technologists love to like have a robot powered pram so that you don't have to push your own baby in the pram. You could just let the pram push itself. Something I've never heard any parent ask for. And yet it was shown quite recently in a major tech convention in Las Vegas. Um, meanwhile, we have been all driving and riding in cars that are tested on a male dummy. Now, Erica, Dr. Thompson, trained as a physicist, I as an historian, math is not my strongest point, but I know it is definitely one of hers. And I think she will tell you, I could be wrong here, but please check me over there, that the difference between male and female bodies in terms of you know, weight, height, et cetera, is no small thing when you're testing a crash situation. And yet it is not a legal requirement anywhere in the world to test on female crash dummies. So Elon Musk can put a crash dummy into space on a Tesla, but won't test Teslas on female crash dummies. It's not that they don't exist, by the way. So he did that in, I cite historian here, 2018, that <laughs> someone invented one, Dr. Astrid Linder has actually come up with the first female model tested on the average woman in October 28th of last year. So don't give up. We do make progress, um, but it's just, you know, which problem were we solving first? How to put one into space or how to like actually come up with ones that are representative and can save the lives of every woman you know? You decide. Someone made a call on that. Facial recognition technology we've discussed a bit. It's one of the many different biometrics technologies that are out there that all draw on your body data, but it's the biggest one that we give to the police other than DNA and fingerprints, which again might be a good thing. You might want to have those things to solve certain crimes, but others like your face and emotions can be taken without your knowledge and consent. And they're not always accurate. The emotions one is particularly based on completely debunked pseudoscience and yet is used in hiring when you're applying for jobs on video calls possibly without you knowing and could determine whether or not you're getting a job. Why is this not being regulated? Great question. Um, and I wanted to just highlight that it's not just your biometrics of your actual body, but your extended self, which comes from all the different devices and ways that you're behaving online to your home, your car. If you've got any kids, what's being done to them in school, both in terms of taking their body data to pay for lunch or check a library book out or do attendance to ed tech, which is again, studying them to see if they're engaged, paying in class, or just how they're behaving in class. Where is all that data going? All about them. The workplace with workplace surveillance tech, particularly taking off during the pandemic. Your city, London is a nice little fishbowl of surveillance technology. And then potentially your country, a little UK there, but it could be anyone. This is a scary slide that we're not spending any time on, but it's available for people who'd like to read it afterwards. It's just to show you again, that biometrics can be used for good or bad. And then if you wanna look where the most cutting edge testing of it is, it's in captive audience situations where people can't say no, which is quite fun. Cause it's like, oh, where actually can't you say no? And it's true. Airports, schools, often the workplace, prisons and on refugees. And again, it's all covered in the book in detail, but this slide deck is available for anyone who wants it if you'd like to take a look. So it's just to show there's two sides, possibly more than two sides, to every technology ethics debate, good or bad, each one of us is gonna to have to make a call and each country or city or whatever might make a different call. And the last one, 
just to give a, a final one, this is the, more in the political philosophy domain. All of the technology that we're discussing and all of this is, is very exciting, but it actually comes down to the power of our devices and the future of AI, et cetera, is all being determined by, frankly, this region in the Asia Pacific and specifically Taiwan. And we had Chris Miller, who won the FT Business Book of the Year prize last year, come to the LSE, I think in October, because um, I came to see him talking about his amazing book, Chip War, which if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend. It is brilliant. He is also an historian, but when you read it, you think he's worked in tech his whole life and you'd think he's a specialist on Asia, but in fact, he's a specialist of Russia. So incredible, incredible multidisciplinary uh, work that he did. And he talks about how most of the processor chips, all of which are powering the advances in AI that you're seeing every day in the headlines, all coming from this region. And there is one company specifically that is the choke point that if it were taken out and it's not like Taiwan is in an interesting place at risk from potential geopolitical conflict or even earthquake, um, a near neighbor enter ballistically uh, from North Korea as well. Lots of things that could happen to Taiwan that could take out the one company that makes most of the chips that power most of our devices. And when I asked him what would happen if this company was taken out, he was like, it would make the economic damage of the pandemic look like child's play. So I put this in the political philosophy section of like who has power, which is why you're seeing now suddenly, apparently everyone woke up, maybe they just read Professor Miller's book. <laughs> and so we need to start making our own chips quick, right? And this becomes this question of like, what does that have to do with ethics? Do you try to make chips on your own? Is that even financially viable? Or do you start taking sides and come up with a team of countries who share similar values to you so that you can do economies of scale and share the cost because this is not a cheap business. So suddenly deciding where you feel on things that will be determining trade policy, but also human rights um, and civil liberties starts to become an ethical issue that shapes the political philosophy discussion. So it all becomes very intertwined, which is why it's handy to have our little Swiss army knife of philosophy to look at a technology ethics debate. So that is, that's the book, there you go. I love how he focuses our mind. He's like, if you thought atomic weapons were scary, this is what's going to determine the next era of risk and power. Um, so take a look at that book if you like it. And that's just a sample of you know, some recent headlines telling you this is not just an abstract theory or discussion, this is having real world consequences and is on the front pages of papers for a reason. So there you are. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Diane, over to you. So um, great presentations, thank you. I don't have any slides to inflict on you. I'm just going to comment on a few issues that have been raised by um, Erica and Stephanie. Um, I'm presuming that people who came along this evening have um, at least heard of ChatGPT and possibly used it. Um, I was in Silicon Valley in November, having been there six months before, six months before in April last year. There's a lot of talk about how exciting these large language models are going to be, these generative models. And in September, people were slightly taken aback at how quickly that technology had advanced. If you've used it, you'll know that um, it can give very plausible questions. They are quite often complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. And if you challenge it, it will say, you're right, that, that was not correct. Uh, here's a different answer. Do you like this one any better? Um, that will soon get fixed. And we are going to have to think about models a lot because it's going to be part of daily business and daily life. But models are ubiquitous anyway. You can't avoid them. Um, historians have models. What were the causes of the First World War? That's a model. Um, we have models in life. Why isn't the central heating working? I have a theory about which bits of it fit together and how they might work. Why does Mr. Darcy behave as he does in the book? What makes people drop litter rather than put it in the bin? So we have these um, theories or models that we use all the time to make sense of the uh, multi-dimensionality of life and to try and figure out what on earth is going on. So criticizing models in general isn't a viable option. We're gonna to have to get used to them uh, through AI and machine learning. The point, the theme really of the evening is to be somewhat 
thoughtful about how they're using all these models, how they put together, um, what are you trying to do? So I want to highlight two points really. One is about data, which we've heard a little bit about, and the other is about how models can be self-reinforcing because they act on the world. So on data, this is absolutely the fuel of these machine learning systems and AI, um, but it's not like a standard economic input to production. It's what we call an economics non-rival, which means that different people can use it at the same time. And it's got lots of externalities, it can, which can be negative. We often talk about the, the privacy externalities of data, um, that if I reveal something about myself, it may reveal something about other people too, or data may be sucked up that reveals things about me that I don't want anybody to know. But there are positive externalities as well. A lot of data is only useful if you can combine it with something else or you can compare it to a population average. So the more you share it, the more it can be used for useful purposes uh, as a kind of common pool resource. So it's like um, a public good in, if you um, have done this in, in basic economics, which has important implications for how you think about investing in data, how it's governed, how it's regulated, and who should be able to access it. But what I want to highlight for you is that data isn't a natural object. The word stems from the Latin for given, but it's not given, it's constructed, it's produced. Um, so there's not measurement error about a lot of data in social science, there's epistemic error about it. What is the concept that it's trying to measure and what does it mean? So data bias, which Stephanie alluded to, is a well understood phenomenon. It's not very easy to fix, although there are people working on fixing it. And that's because we have a biased society. So all the social data reflects the categories that we've constructed for that society.
maximize. Can you define that unambiguously in political and social domains? Generally not, something I've written about with my colleague Adrian Weller. Do you have data that measures that objective function? Often not, you've got a proxy for it and it's known as the alignment problem in AI. Is your data biased? Does it cover everything you need to know about or do you have missing data? If you're making automated decisions, what's the impact going to be on people's lives? If it's a big impact, you ought to be more careful. Have you included a room, room for participation because procedural justice matters, otherwise you're going to get the peasants rebelling overlords? Is the decision-making entity trustworthy and trusted? And finally, that point about incentives. How aligned are the incentives of the decision makers and the people to whom they are doing the decisions? So that's just a few uh, reflections prompted by these two fantastic books. I hope you buy my book too, but um, I'm going to stop there and hand it back to Manoush. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Hey, well, you have all raised such a huge number of big issues and big questions, and I'm going to invite the audience to add some more. Um, we've got about mm, just short of 20 minutes, so I'm going to ask you to make the questions brief. I'm going to take three from the audience, and then I'm going to turn to the online audience. So who would like to start? Okay, Mike is near you. Let's start with you. And if you could just introduce yourself. Um Hi everyone, I'm Will. I work in the civil service on a um, fairly well-known model called the policy simulation model um, for welfare. Um, and but that aside from that, you mentioned about chat GPT, and that's something that I've been like thinking about using. And I just wondered what you thought the ethical questions were about using like things like chat gpt in government um you know like using language models to replace people um things like that so just a bit more on the ethics and impacts of natural language models okay thank you who would like to go next i'm going to take this woman here and then this gentleman here. Um, Helen Stagg, Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, so those of us who are involved in advising both government and politicians and also looking at the interaction with the public during the pandemic um, often hit the problem which you defined, Dr. Thompson, in terms of defining the limits of modelling without undermining the confidence in the science, which is something that we constantly hit our heads up against. And I just wondered if you could reflect a bit more on sort of where you think we are in that space and how we can go forwards. Thank you. Just here. Yes, my name is Stefano Bonf and my question is, I think Dr. Uh, Thompson, what is your opinion on this new approach that is digital twinning? And I know that here in UK is advancing on this concept. Don't think digital twinning is a combination of data at the same time technology. You have this nice book that I appreciated, Landing, let's say, Escape from Modern Land, that I bought it. And I think your concern is the reality activity of data. So this type of interaction between digital twinning, so this means the concept of data and virtual objective, and an interaction between, uh, let's say, the two, this should come with some more reality and then it's you can using for planning and uh, uh, any other activities. My concern is the digital twin concept and the new emerging technologies, the metaverse. Thank you. Okay. Maybe Erica, I'll ask you to take the question on confidence in the science and the digital twin, and then maybe Diana and Stephanie, the one about chat GPT. Okay, um, thank you. Well, maybe I'll start with the digital twins then. I'm, I mean, I think the, the question really, I mean, it doesn't really matter where you are on the spectrum between being kind of really almost fully data constrained and being almost fully expert judgment. Um, you always have some input of expert judgment, unless you're in model land, in which case you're just a pure mathematician. Um, you always have some input of value judgments. You know, whatever data you have, you have chosen to take that data rather than other data. You've decided how to project it into your model. You've made assumptions 
that fit it with the model. So, so yes, perhaps, I mean, I'm not fully familiar with exactly what the differences are between digital twinning per se and just modeling with decent data assimilation. I suspect they're very similar. Um, so I think that you you just you still have the same issues. It doesn't it doesn't absolve you of the the question of what value judgments are embedded within the model and within the choice of data that you are taking. You still have to answer that question. So it it may well be a, a good way forward. It may well be very useful, and it will have the same uses and perhaps the same drawbacks as using models in any other way. Is that good enough? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then um, Professor Stagg's question about models and not, you know, defining the limits of modeling without throwing away the, you know, the important bits, the useful bits, the, the confidence without undermining that confidence. I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a, I suppose there's a technical question there and there's a social question. There's a technical question about how do we go about working out what those limits are. And I think that, you know, what I've outlined in terms of how we should be doing the statistics when we've got our model output, how we should be pushing the models out rather than constantly trying to pull them in and pull them together. We should be pushing them out as far as they go, and we should be using a diversity of perspectives to do that. I think that that, that framework is the mathematical framework that we should be using to define those limits. Now, the communication question of how you then help people to understand that without undermining the confidence in the, the basics of the science. That's a really difficult one and a much more social question. I mean, maybe you and your colleagues have some reflections yourself on how best to do that. Maybe that's something, you know, it's certainly something that has played out in real time over the last couple of years when we've seen these different models entering into the conversation and being you know challenged from different quarters we either with respect to data or with respect to the values that they imply or with respect to the things that are missing from those models um i think it's a good and positive conversation to have uh and you know maybe i'm not quite answering your question because i don't quite know the answer i think it is a really difficult line to tread in between you know having the confidence that we should rightly have but not overstepping it and not over abusing it yeah it's a, it's a tricky one i mean if i might just add I, I thought one of the healthy things during the pandemic was the fact that uh many models were discussed in public sometimes they were wrong we got new data and we learned more and then the models adapted and then the public learned that we got new data and the model was adapted and that iterative process was i thought healthy in reassuring people about you know experts don't have all the answers but they have a process for getting better answers and it taught some a little bit of healthy skepticism but also a sense that it things improve over time as we improve the quality of our analysis and research and so on so i i thought that was positive in terms of we're all, we're all going to have to get used to talking about models much more. Exactly. And I, I thought the pandemic was a bit of an opportunity to engage people in those questions. So on, on the chat GPT question, we, we can't ignore these tools um, or not use them because the bad guys are going to. So there have been arguments for restraining the development of AI models. And I think that's just not feasible. We don't want um, a kind of arms race where we're not even trying um, to do it. Um, but I think it's a question of being transparent about it and being clear, as I think Erica was saying, about what value judgments you're putting into it and, and, and where you're using it. So using it as a, um, a thought experiment or a scenario projection in the kinds of social context seems to me to be a sensible way to think about it. But there also, there's a great potential as well. I mean, it can um, make a lot of um, repetitive and boring tasks much, much easier to do. And people who code are finding it an incredibly useful productivity tool for making their jobs easier. Is there anything on ChatGPT? Okay. Okay. Very good. <laughs> uh, so let me turn, uh, Nathaniel, to the questions online. Do you have anything for us? Yeah. So we have um, about three questions and one comment, but I will begin with the comments. So this is from an alumnus of LSE, George. He says um, there are two points to take into account. Uh, one is any model is an intellectual abstraction of reality and certainly not reality itself. 
and I resembles um, a well-known joke of a guy searching for his car keys in the middle of the night under a lamppost. And when mm -hmm. asked, is this where you lost them? He replies, I don't know, but there is certainly more light here. <laughs> so that's an interesting comment there. But you have a question from Camille Johnski from the University of Wuj in Poland. And he says, um, over recent years, policy decision-making shifted from balancing interest as represented by politicians in parliament towards weighting supposedly scientific evidence by experts. How would you comment on the following problems? One, excessive impact of expert biases or blind spots. And two, legitimacy of what was supposed to be a government of the people by the people, not by enlightened experts. To give an example of such conflict, anti-COVID restrictions primarily protected the elders, but their costs, including non-monetary like mental health and poor education fell upon the young. And there was no democratic process on this whatsoever. Yeah. So that's the first one. Okay. Why don't you give me all three and we'll or would someone like to respond to that one quickly? Mm. Let's take them. Let's take them all. Okay. okay. So the second question is from Xavier in Canada. He says, um, as a student of mathematics at the University of London, um, what are your thoughts about it? Thank you. What are your thoughts about the, the ethics of mathematics? And then the third one is from Augustine in Chiang Mai University, Thailand. He says, um, please, what are your thoughts about the fact that AI is a complement to human intelligence rather than a substitute? Yeah. Okay, that's... very good. Who would like to start? Yeah, yeah? go ahead. Eric. Um, well, maybe just starting with the ethics of mathematics. I mean, I think I think part of what I'm trying to do with my book is think about the development of an ethics of mathematics and think about how we, you know, it's easy to say, again, that mathematics is neutral, but of course it's not neutral like any other technology. It's a way of thinking and it embodies certain kinds of values and value judgments that we make as individuals and as a society. And so, you know, we need to be thinking about how those are embodied in our mathematics as well. Um, and then the the other question was, uh, what was the first question again, sorry? The, I was going to come to that. So the first question is about like how you'd comment on the excessive impacts of experts biases or blind spots. Yeah, experts. I mean, ex absolutely. So experts and trust in experts. So as I think I said, it, that actually the question of to what extent we trust our experts and to what extent we believe that our experts have our best interests at heart and that they are that they share our values and that they share they are acting in the best interests of the people or which people how does it how do we define which people um who is who is sort of part of the community of decision makers and who is part of the community of people who are affected by the decisions that are being made you know that the, these questions are first order to how the technology is being used how the models are being used how the models are being developed and so absolutely we need to be um investigating what is what is under the hood of all of these models and thinking about how um how the models shape the way that we think and how the way that we think shapes the way that we choose to make models and these obviously having put it both ways around you can see also that there's a feedback loop in the way that diane was describing you know in the rivers of data carving out channels but also the models carve out channels for themselves in terms of the way that we think and the way the things that we think are important the mechanisms that we understand and the way that we rationalize our actions our choice of actions and our interventions in the world whether that's public policy or individual actions or regulation or business choices all of these are you know they they're sort of concretized within the models which concretize a set of value judgments when we need to understand what those are and who would like to take the um, ai complementary versus substitution for humanity Diana? I, I quite like to ignore all the questions actually <laughs> <laughs> and just just make this point that we're in a time of huge technological transformations and digital tech's part of the AI as part of it but there'll be the energy transformation as well and the structure of the economy and our societies is um, in a state of upheaval and um, people are a bit fed up understandably but i think this means that we're going to have these conversations about ethics ethics of mathematics ethics of modeling ethics of data that's you know we've got to have these conversations now 
So I'll let Stephanie answer the question. Um, <clears throat> so I get worried because I think if I were a high school student now, I would definitely have been one of the kids who was just trying to do my homework through any tool necessary so that I could just get away with it. Um, but also to mess around with the tool and like, you know, figure out the limits. And I've also taught kids. So I would then, you know, set a thief to catch a thief. I would want to, I would be hopefully on the side of the guy who's at Princeton who coded the chat GPT zero, which was, you know, the first attempt at how can you as a teacher, as a grown up, um, tell if your student has used chat GPT on their things. So you're just, again, it's sort of like with cybersecurity, you create a virus and then you have to create people who can hunt viruses and test to see if your system has been infected. And this is both fascinating, but again, like I could keep using the phrase migraine inducing, you just sometimes have to lie down when you do this work because you're like, God, it just never ends. And it feels yeah. like with all progress, each progress seems to also create like sort of Hydra, 10 other problems you now have to solve. Um, so, you know, will we use AI for, for good, I'm sure we will. And our, we're already seeing incredible breakthroughs on like drug discovery and protein, protein discovery. Um, but I'm absolutely convinced because humans are humans that we will also use it for really, you know, not just naughty things, but probably pretty harmful things. And then there's the like, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There could be people who try genuinely to use AI to do something useful and like unintentionally create something awful, maybe like secondary tertiary effects down the road of their thinking, it creates something awful and then somebody else has to go in and clean that mess up. So my view on this is like, how do we have conversations like we're having tonight? How do books get written and you know, put out into the world from, from top thinkers um, who can help us, all of us, think about this because we're not living in a world now where you can be like oh that's just something for the mathematicians to think about or that's just for tech people to think about um in companies when i first started out it was always like this sort of separate section to the rest of business and you never really interacted with them and now we hear everybody saying every company is a technology company you might not think you are but you are and what that means for democracy and like you know, can you even exist in this world without a smartphone? And what does that mean for people who can't afford it or who find that technology really difficult? All of those things. So I'm, I don't just limit this discussion to AI. I think about it like very broadly with technology. And I think the answer will always be, you know, how humans, I shouldn't say always, in case the AI overlords hear this <laughs> and one day decide to like exterminate me, but um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, for all too many years watching the Terminator as a child, that fear never goes away. But I think this idea that if all of us are thinking about it, I want our lawmakers empowered to have these conversations, and I'm not convinced that they are, right? So we have a, a change journey to go on. Parents, kids, teachers, it's going to be everyone. I don't think this is a conversation that we can opt out of just because you're not into tech. Like tech is into you or into us. So we better have something to say back. Okay, very good. Well, uh, I wanted to start by thanking our Wumanal uh, <laughs> for doing such a fantastic job, a really kind of, I think certainly for me, opening up a set of big questions, which I think all of us are gonna have to think about in the years to come. And uh, fortunately, their books are available outside and they're going to stick around to sign them if you would like that. Uh, so you can continue the conversation afterwards. But please join me in thanking them for a fantastic <laughs>